Nina De Rosa has been an extension master gardener since 2016. She is a coordinator for the Overlook Organic Vegetable Demonstration Garden. She maintains her own gardens of native plants, vegetables, and herbs. In advocate of replacing lawns with a more sustainable landscape, she is hopeful that spreading information about good gardening practices will create a more diverse and healthier environment. With that, I am now turning over the presentation to Nina. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining me today. I'm very excited to be talking about autumn and leaves and composting, and I hope that you do learn something new, and uh, maybe you can type something in and teach us. So let's get on with this. This is presented by Virginia Tech Cooperative Extension. And uh, we are a partnership with Virginia State College and Virginia Tech. We've been promoting sound gardening practices since 1985. We do that through help desks, plant clinics that we have in our libraries throughout the counties of Arlington and Alexandria. We do public education like this. Uh, we have demonstration gardens where you can actually come, talk to the gardeners and ask questions. And we have a fabulous website that has a wealth of information. Uh, we also are on Instagram and Facebook. Leaves are the most abundant crop in fall. And what we choose to do with them, it's confusing me. <laughs> Trees have mined minerals from deep in the subsoil and brought them to the surface. They're nature's nutrient recycler. It's the whole cycle of photosynthesis and releasing oxygen into the atmosphere and sequestering carbon into the soil and returning nutrients back to the soil. New Jersey State had done a analysis of what nutrients were in dried leaves. And all these nutrients were in all the leaves that they studied, but They've differed from species and the environment of the trees. But you can see how much uh, trace minerals and nutrients that we are um, getting from our dried leaves if we use them. Now, of course, some leaves are better than others. And the good leaves would be maple, ash, willow, fruit trees, mulberry trees. Uh, the bad leaves are those leaves that are high in lignin. Lignin is an organic polymer and those polymers are very tightly bound in these leaves and make it very difficult to break them down. And those would be magnolia trees, uh, some oak, oak trees. They are not as bad as uh, magnolia, but they are a little bit more difficult to break down, take a little bit longer. Beech trees, sweet chestnuts and holly. And the magnolia and the holly are the shiny, really tough leaves that are obviously difficult to break down. The things that I would recommend that you avoid totally would be black walnut and eucalyptus because these trees contain a natural herbicide, which you do not want in your garden, affecting your perennials, your shrubs, or your vegetables. I just wanted to demonstrate what the magnolia, if people haven't been exposed to them, these what are magnolia, leaves on your left. They're very thick and tough. I wouldn't put those in my leaf mold or my leaf bin unless you want to wait two or three years for them to break down. And on the other side, you can see the beech trees. They're a little bit softer. They're easier to break down. On your left here, we have some skip laurel leaves. They're very tough and they're also shiny. So I would avoid putting those into your leaf mulch. The other one is are oak. Now you can see they're not as thick as the laurels, but they do take longer and the pin oak, which isn't that bad. So let's talk about how we can use these leaves to benefit our garden. There's so many ways. Fallen leaves create a habitat for overwintering beneficial insects. And that statement is an overstatement. There are so many things living in the fallen leaves that I can't even begin to talk about it. 
there's an article that I think I have in my uh, resource and it's called Life in the Leaf Litter. And it's about uh, 15 pages and it describes all the different microbes and insects that live in the leaves over winter. And I'm gonna tell you why that's important in our next slides. They also provide foraging for birds during the winter because you have all these insects in there and the birds can go in there and dig around and have something to eat during the winter. These leaves can also be used as habitat for your vermicomposting bins or your worm composters. And because they have springtails and microbes in there that are beneficial to your composting worms. Here's just a picture of a great spangled fiddle, I can never say this really correctly, fiddly butterfly. This one overwinters in the leaves and it stays near the wild violets because it's young like to eat that uh, when they come out of their pulpi. Here's another picture of a little wood frog sitting in a leaf over winter. And he's asking you, please don't throw my home away. Here's a way you can create a habitat in your um, outside your cultivated garden, someplace where you won't cause too much attention, but you just throw these leaves down, wet them and then cover them and give your insects a place to rest during the winter and come back and do really good things in your garden in the spring. I have to talk about the soil food web when we talk about our leaves, because our leaves, you can see at the very start on the left is organic matter. We need organic matter in our soil because this organic matter is broken down and eaten by the fungi and feed the nematodes. The arthropods are the insects that have the exoskeletons that are very helpful in breaking down all the organic material in the soil so that the fungi and bacteria can utilize it and turn it into usable food for your plants. Without this biomass in your soil, your plants will not be healthy because they will not be getting the food they need to grow. So when you throw out your leaves, you're also throwing away your beneficial insects and your butterflies and so many, so many things that you can't even begin to fathom. There are millions of things that grow in those leaves. So where do the pollinators go in the winter? They go into the ground. The native bees go into the ground to nest. They also, the queen bees, they go into the ground and they use the leaves to insulate them from the cold in the winter. We also have the larvae that go into the stems of the dead perennial branches or some shrubs, and they stay there over the winter. And that's why your cleanup time for your yard should be first time you wanna mow your lawn in the spring or in my area when the plum trees finish blooming. Up in Pennsylvania, you wanna wait until your apple trees start to bloom because that's when the bees, when they emerge, they like to feed on those blossoms. Do you have any questions so far? Oak leaves, even if they take longer to break down, are they still beneficial? Oak leaves are great if you're a purist. I'm not a purist. I put everything, I don't put magnolia leaves, but I do put everything in there. Uh, if you're a purist, you wanna take your oak leaves and do them separately because they take maybe two years. So if you have leaf mold and you wanna use it, You'll just have to take those undecomposed leaves and put them to the side and then you'll have your leaf mold. But if you put them in there, you're gonna have whole pieces of leaves in your leaf mold. And if that doesn't bother you, that's fine. You can still use it. The next question is sort of related. What can be done with leaves high in lignin? You can shred them. I'll talk about a really quick way to make leaf mold in three or four months. You can shred them four times and let them sit and they'll grow mycorrhizal fungi. They are totally responsible for leaf decomposition. So you wanna break them down four times and you want to keep them wet. And if you really wanna get it to go fast, you wanna get woodland soil, put it in a cheesecloth and put it in water so that all the nutrients, the fungi, everything drains into the water. And then you'll pour that over your leaves and set them there and that will help break those down quicker. Yeah. Next question is to insects over winter in leaf litter that are high in lignum. Yeah, they do. Any kind of leaves that they can get cover underneath, they're great. So if you, well, we're talking about two different things here. We're talking about making leaf mold. So with leaf mold, we're crunching, we're killing all those 
insects. Okay, we're not saving that as a habitat. Now, if we wanna make a habitat, I think I showed in one of our slides how you can make a habitat. You don't wanna shred your leaves, you wanna keep them whole. So if you wanna take all of your magnolia leaves and put them in a corner of your garden, that would be a great habitat for insects. So you can use that as something in the corner of your garden and leave it. Okay, that's all the questions. Great, thank you for those questions. It makes it more exciting for me. Okay, so leaf compost as a soil amendment. This is what the leaf compost is. It's a soil amendment. It's not really a fertilizer. So when you use leaf mold, you are increasing the soil biomass. And how you do that is you're providing nutrition for the microbes in the soil. You're creating food for the microbes in the soil. So you're drawing these microscopic microbes to the to the area and they're breaking it all down and they're causing other organisms to come. So when you feed the soil, depending on what you feed it, you will bring different types of microorganisms to your soil. And if you create a diversity and an abundance, your plants will be so much healthier because they will be able to get the food that they need. It's a really good thing to have more microbes in your soil because without the microbes, your plants will not get fed. And also you improve the structure and the turf of your uh, soil, which means the soil becomes more open with the, what they call it aggregates or spaces between the molecules in your soil. And what that does is allow your soil to retain moisture. And over time, you won't need as much fertilizer if you do use fertilizer, because the fertilizer will be trapped in the soil and be able to be utilized when your plants need it. And also the holding of the water will reduce er erosion. And it also uh, allows the soil to hold more oxygen. So if you think about it, you're creating a really good environment for the microbes. You're feeding them, you're giving them water and oxygen. When you do add leaf mold, what happens is as it breaks down, uh, organic acids are released in the soil and it binds with the aluminum and iron. Okay, if you have a lot of aluminum and iron in your soil, your phosphates are bound, your plants can't utilize them. So when you do this, you free up the phosphates and phosphates, if you don't know, are extremely important for germination. So that's a good thing. Also, it's an ideal substitute for non-sustainable peat moss because peat mosses can't be replenished. So when we use it, we cannot make more. So to summarize what we just talked about, Leaf mold will improve your, your soil's physical, chemical, and biological properties. And that's, that's pretty awesome because it's also free. Just like with substitutes, like if you are a person who likes butter and you have to shift to a butter substitute, which do you think is going to be more desirable? The butter. So it's just like organic food for your soil, or do you want synthetic food for your soil? So this is an important thing about climate change and carbon sequestration. We're talking about improving your soil. Now, if you have more spaces in your soil for, for saving things, you'll have the photosynthesis, the trees are like their solar panels are taking our carbon from our air and making that into sugars and carbon for the soil. So the sugars are used to build the plant or tree, but they're also put into the roots to feed the microorganisms. And they also put carbon, solid organic carbons into the soil where they are saved and kept there. And oxygen is released into the air. So it's, it's really good for our environment if we have good soil. So by regenerating our soils, we can sequester more carbon underground and slow climate change. So now we can use leaf mold as a mulch. If we want to grind them a little bit or we wanna leave them whole, we can put them underneath our perennials. It moderates the temperature of the soil. So you don't have those freezes and refreezes. So it maintains an even temperature in your soil. And it also prolongs microbial activity in the soil. So that's also creating more food for the plant, keeping it healthier and preventing it from getting uh, diseases. Because of the leaves are on top of the soil, they're blocking the sunlight and they, they're used as a weed control. In the winter in your vegetable gardens, if you have root crops, 
that you don't want to take up, you don't want to store. You can leave them in the ground and cover them with leaves. So you're insulating them from the snow. You first want to mark them so you know where to go when you want to dig them up if you get a heavy snow. Also, on the top of the soil, as well as using it as a soil amendment, the leaf mold increases the moisture content in the soil. By covering with the leaves, you're preventing evaporation from that soil above ground. And it also protects plants from soil-borne diseases because when the rain comes or you water and the water splashes on the bare soil, it picks up microorganisms, fungus, onto the leaves of your plant, which causes disease. So some other uses for leaf litter are, you can use them in making compost because they are the brown or the carbon in your composting pile. You can just store them and do nothing to make leaf mold. They also have these biodegradable jute composting bags that you can pack full of leaves and then bury them. And that will create a really good soil and leave them for another season. You can start a veggie garden by sheet mulching. And uh, we'll talk about that later on in the presentation. And you can just dig leaves right into your garden to overwinter. You could just dig a trench and bury them and uh, they will deteriorate over a time. They're not gonna deteriorate in an, anaero in an aerobic way, but in an anaerobic way, but you're still getting all those nutrients back into your soil. You can also have fun. Kids love to run through leaves. And while they're doing that, they're breaking down the leaves into smaller pieces and helping them disintegrate quicker. Uh, these leaves are clean because they've been on the tree, the rain has fallen, they've been dried by the sun, and the birds have picked off all the insects that are on them. So they're pretty much clean until we leave them in the ground or in the street. You can also do crafts. Uh, it's a good way to teach your, your children what types of trees are growing in your area from the different leaves you collect. So now we're gonna talk about how to get the most out of your leaves. How are we gonna do that? This is what you're gonna need. You're gonna need a rake. You're gonna need a leaf vacuum, not a blower. We're gonna suck these up and mine actually shreds them as I suck them up into that leaf vacuum or you can use a mulching mower or just a plain lawn mower that's on a high setting so that you can go over those and just grind them up into your grass. I'd like to recommend that you use an electric lawn mower if you can or to reduce the air and noise pollution from those types of equipment. And of course you need leaves. And this is like Christmas time for me because I collect leaves from everyone. I'm not so worried about what type of leaves they are. I sort them out and I grind them with my lawnmower and I store them in bins for use with my compost. And I also use them as mulch in my lawn and under my perennials. So like we talked about before, you would go over your lawn. Now, if you don't have a super amount of leaves, you can mow them over and grind them up and use them as food for your lawn and you'll get a very healthy lawn in the spring. You don't want to leave wet whole leaves on your lawn because that would cause the grass to smother. When I collect my leaves, I put them in my yard and I throw them down and I mow them over and then I suck them up with my lawnmower after I've gone over them a couple of times. Now to optimize that, you want to make sure your oil and water filters are clean and your blades are sharp. And after I've gone over those leaves a little bit, you can barely tell that they're there and I'm ready for spring and it didn't cost me anything. Purdue did a study that they put 4,000 pounds of maple mulch leaves in one acre and they only reported positive and economical results. Mulching around your trees. Whenever I walk my dog, I am appalled to see the gardening services had mulched these trees the wrong way. And I usually bring a little rake and I rake it away from the tree trunk. Because when you mulch your trees like this, it's called volcano mulching. What you're doing is you're retaining moisture against the tree bark, which is used as a defense against diseases and insects. So what you're doing is you're causing the tree to deteriorate in that area of the bark and it eventually start to grow new roots, it'll be soft, and it'll be a perfect place for disease and insects to get into your tree. The proper way to mulch a tree is to keep the mulch away from the trunk and spread it to a diameter of at least three feet and only to a maximum of three to four inches. When you mulch your perennial plants and shrubs, you can do it either with whole leaves or with threaded leaves. 
and you want to apply three to six inches in your mulching area. Now to make leaf mulch, you can do it just by getting all your leaves and putting them uh, in a pile, or you can use a, a wire cage and just dump them in there. Uh, as you dump them in there, you can wet them with each layer, and then you just leave them there. And the following season, at least half of them will be completely turned into leaf mold without any effort at all. Now, if you wanna do it in a quicker way, you want to take your leaves and you want to grind them at least four times. So you want to put them through a grinder four times. Add water. And as I said before, you want to get some woodland soil and make tea out of it and pour that all in your leaves. And you'll see that it'll deteriorate really quickly. It will get hot. And when you turn it over, it'll be smoking and it'll deteriorate. But this is all done by fungi. So you won't see a lot of insects in there. You'll see worms because they like the heat and the leaf mold, but this is purely done by fungi. And if you have a lot of property and you have area where you can just take your leaves and dump them in the part of your yard and just leave them, when you want to make uh, soil amendments or you want to make a seed starter, you can just go in there and push the leaves aside and dig in there and you'll find this beautiful dust. It's called duff and leaf mold, there's hardly any smell to it, but it's fluffy and light. And it can actually hold 60% of its weight in water. It's amazing stuff. You can actually grow seeds right in that. This is what it looks like. This is what, it, just one overwintering and I had all this terrific stuff. In Arlington County, they sell these uh, little rings, they're plastic and they're open to about six, six feet. Uh, diameter and they're they're great they're about twenty dollars and they're available at the trade yard in uh, Arlington County this is a really neat way to start a new bed either a vegetable bed or a perennial bed you pick the area where you want to put your new bed and you take uh, mulch or you take your leaf mulch put it down you put cardboard or paper and you make layers you can use grass clippings you can use straw Kitchen scraps, if you want to bury them, keep them wet and covered and turn them into everything so you don't attract rodents. And you just leave it there. And when you come back, you just plant right into that in the next year and it'll be so great. And you didn't have to remove the grass or anything. You can create a planting ring, which is a smaller version of a of sheet mulching. So you just take a little ring, however big you want, and you layer it with leaves and kitchen scraps and grass and whatever, fill it up and then leave it in the corner and, or leave it where you want to use it because it's not easy to move. And uh, you'll be ready for the next season to plant right into there. You can plant squash plants, you can plant uh, whatever you want. If you don't have enough area in your, in your vegetable garden, you can use it as a supplement or you could just plant flowers. You can also make a seed starter with leaf mold. And I provided you with the recipe. And this is a really good way to start your seeds. It gives it food and the leaf mold is a substitute for the peat moss. And, and you have your perlite to give it air spaces in there. Mix thoroughly and you can keep it in a dry container for a very long time. Now for our heavy feeders, like your tomato plants, after they've sprouted, you have to, when you want to, Re repot them before you're going to put them outside and your brassicas, uh, your broccoli and your cabbages. You want to add a little bit of worm castings to give that plant a little bit more food to eat because they are very heavy eaters and they'll grow much more sturdy. This is a way to store your leaves. I have a three bin composter and I don't use it in the way that they recommend. They recommend, you know, you start with one bin and the medium when you're half finished and then to take the finished product to the very end. What I do is I keep a whole, the middle section full of dried leaves and covered. They are shredded because it makes it compost quicker. I do composting in one, I store my leaves in the center and then I do another composting pile in the end. You can also keep them in paper bags. The county gives us paper bags to store the leaves and people leave them out in front of the yard. I take all their leaves and I just put them in a quiet spot in my yard where you can't really see them. And I leave them there. These leaves are going to be shredded and then put in that wire container because shredded leaves 
reduced considerably when you shred them. So you can keep a lot more in there. Do we have any questions? If we remove leaves high in lignum to a separate corner and use other leaves in garden beds, what is the best kind of uh, mulch leaves to use under the magnolia trees? Would that be bag mulch? Another related question is, uh, this person has a lot of uh, magnolia leaves that are not breaking down. Do you have any suggestions? You break down or shred them to smaller pieces, they'll break down quicker, but they still take a long time because they do have a high amount of lignin in them. So you just have to be patient. Tougher leaves do not have a high concentration of nutrients in them. They do have nutrients, but they don't have a high concentration. So if you don't want to keep them and you want to give them to the county, that's fine. But if you want to persevere and break them up and put them in the corner of your yard and let them deteriorate or make a habitat for animals, that's also very good. And the other question about the magnolia tree, you can use the leaf mulch that you've made with other leaves for your magnolia tree. The next question is, some yards are treated heavily with uh, fertilizers and weed killers, herbicides. Are the leaves from uh, these kind of yards safe to use in uh, composting? I would say yes, purely because the synthetic fertilizers that are used, if their soil is not good, they're gonna wash right away. Okay, they don't go down into the subsoils where the trees are, are pulling up these nutrients. So I would say yes. So now we're into making compost and you do need leaves to make compost. You need leaves or you need cardboard or paper. So what is composting? Uh, as gardeners, we are not patient. We want compost yesterday. So what we do is we fuel the decomposition process by combining just the right amount of carbons and just the right amount of nitrogens to make this decaying process happen really quickly. So what do we do? We shred everything we put in there. We make sure it's small quantities. We have an equal amount. Uh, we don't have too much carbon to slow down the process or too much nitrogen to create ammonia and release nitrogen that we're trying to save in our compost into the air. So it's just a way for us to make things happen quicker. And it's really fun. It's like a witch's brew. The more diverse things you put in it, the better it will be. What is compost? When you finish your compost, if you put a variety of things in your compost, it becomes a fertilizer. It has nitrogen, it has potassium, and it has phosphorus, the three most important things that your soil and plants need to grow. Nitrogen, is used for growth, for plant growth. If you don't have a nitrogen source in your soil, your plants aren't gonna grow very well. Phosphorus, you need for germination and for seed establishment. And potassium, you need to uh, regulate photosynthesis. They're very important nutrients that you need for your soil. And it also acts as a soil amendment because it changes your physical, chemical, and biologic characteristics. So when you use compost on a regular basis, you're going to stabilize the pH in your soil. You're going to make it able to hold nutrients, water, and air much better. And it'll be a lot less compacted and your plants will have an easier way to grow to spread their roots through it. There's simple ingredients for composting. You need something to compost. You need your ingredients. You need moisture, air, and temperature. So the browns and the carbon-rich materials would be sawdust, wood chips, straw, newspaper, we said cardboard. Newspapers don't use toxic inks anymore. They're usually soy-based, so that's totally fine if you use shredded newspaper as your browns. But now is the time to collect your leaves if you're gonna use them for your composting during the spring and summer. During the winter, I still compost. It slows down a little bit, but if you cover it, it still continues. You keep it insulated. It will continue, but not as quickly as it does in the summer. So for greens, for the nitrogen-rich material, fresh grass clippings are awesome. Of course, they have to be not treated with chemicals. You don't want any herbicides in your compost. Vegetable, kitchen scraps, fresh straw, healthy plant waste. You don't want to put diseased plants in there. You don't want to put seeds in there. 
and coffee grounds are great. The worms love those. So what is an optimal mix? They say three to one. I usually start with a 50-50. So if you have a bucket and you put in your, or you use your kitchen bucket and you put in your kitchen waste, you use your kitchen container to put the exact same amount of browns in volume into your compost. And you kind of play with that until you get to know what you really need to add. Now, if you have a lot of fruit that you're putting in there, of course, it's a lot wetter than potato peels or zucchini skins. So you need more brown. And as you mix it and get to know about the proper moisture level, you'll be an expert about doing that. Some other materials that you could put in are eggshells. I like to just squish mine up because they take a long time to break down, but they're a great source of calcium. If you want to, you can clean them, put them in a toaster and dry them out. And then I put them in my coffee grinder to make a calcium powder. And you can just sprinkle them around in your vegetable garden or under your perennials and shrubs. It's a great source of calcium. And you can't put too much in because it depends on the soil. If you have a good soil structure, you'll be able to take that calcium in and hold it until the plants really need it. You can put Halloween pumpkins. If you put the whole pumpkin in, you're likely to have pumpkins growing in there because the seeds will grow. Uh, you can put crushed crab and lobster shells or calcium, just as uh, egg shells. They actually take a long time to break down, but they're good. You can use old flower arrangements, coffee grounds, tea bags. If you have a paper tea bag, you can throw the whole thing in. Those cloth ones, I kind of break open because I don't think the cloth deteriorates as well. You can use hops and brewery waste, but again, avoid seeds. So leaves, grass clippings, trimmings from pulled up annuals and small diameter twigs are great for your compost. Actually start with the base of uh, twigs uh, when you're making a new compost pile and then your leaves and you wet it and then you continue to pile it. Every time you put something in, you wanna add a little water. So you can do a continuous pile or you can add to it as you get your supplies. Again, be aware of diseased and any herbicide treated yard waste and avoid anything that's gone to seed because you're, you're gonna have a party in there and have whatever it is growing in there or spreading it into your vegetable garden or under your perennials. These are a little tougher to compost and I wouldn't put them in. Again, we've got our favorite magnolia and holly leaves, corn husks, nutshells, pine needles. Pine needles are great for mulching acid loving plants like azaleas and blueberries. They don't deteriorate well, but they do keep the moisture in underneath the azaleas and the blueberries and they keep the weeds down. These can all be composted, but not in a backyard compost. We have a program in Arlington where we can put these in our yard waste bins and they're taken to a electric composter. It's a huge equipment that they take this and speed it all up and compost everything down. And we talked about mulching with pine needles. They're great for acid loving plants, blueberries and azaleas. You never want to put in uh, weeds, or poison ivy or whatever you don't want all over your yard. You don't wanna put that in your compost. No diseased plants or insect ridden plants, uh, oil and grease and meat or dairy products that will just draw rodents. These all can be composted in a, in a very high powered uh, composter that will get your compost to 180 degrees. But our backyard composters usually only get to about 130 and 140 degrees. So those are not acceptable. Black walnuts and eucalyptus have a natural herbicide in them. These plants drop their leaves and those leaves prevent any competing things from growing under the trees. So you don't want herbicides spread into your vegetable garden or under your shrubs. And buckeye leaves don't create herbicides, but they're poisonous. So I wouldn't wanna put those in my compost either. Any part of the buckeye is a poisonous. So for a compost pile to really break down quickly, it has to be at least three by three. For quick composting, that's the main size. You don't wanna get anything over four feet because it's extremely hard to turn unless you're just gonna let it sit there and do the layer thing and then break it down in the future and use it. It gets too cumbersome if it's bigger than that. Here's some containers that you can use. Uh, they're open air containers. And just as we made leaf mulch with the wire bin, you can also compost. 
by making layers of a twig, leaves, kitchen scraps, grass, add more leaves, and then just keep layering it until it's full. And of course, adding water in between each layer that's applied will will compost over time, but it's great. You take off the wire and you'll have beautiful compost uh, to put into your beds, or you can start a new bed right there. You have the three bin uh, composter, you're adding your compost. The closed bin is where you're finishing it off with your low temperature microbes. Once the compost, it heats to a very high heat and then it will slow down and it continues to break down with low temperature microbes. When you get it to a very fine where you don't recognize anything that you put into it, then it's finished and you can store it in the last bin. I use my compost so fast that I don't need a storage bin for that. We have this green one in the bottom. It's a, it's a sun, sun cone and you just put things in there and they say that it keeps everything warm and it breaks down. I've never used that. You could use it for leaf mold too, but I don't really like spending money on things. I'd rather do it naturally. But if you're so inclined to try that, that would be fun. Another one is just where you continually put things in. Uh, you do reach a maximum with that and you have to wait. And the finished product is on the ground and you can shovel it out. You don't get very much, but it does the trick. When you start a composting a pile or bin, you need to pick a really good location. You wanna put it in the shade because the heat that's generated from the breakdown of the organic material is giving you the heat, not the sun. So you wanna keep it in a shade. The sun will only dry out your compost and slow the process. You wanna have it on a level area that drains well. You don't want it sitting in a pile of water or through a stream or something like that. Or you wanna keep it away from permanent wood structures because it is moist and it will have insects in there and it will contribute to the rot of your wood, wood structure. You want to have a water supply. You can either have a rain barrel or at least a hose that will reach out there because you really need to add water. Moisture is a very important thing for composting. Or you could just put it, as we talked about, right on top of the new planting spot and it will just be ready for you the next season. The benefits of compost are amazing. Compost is a fertilizer and a soil amendment. It's natural and it's something that your soil will really take to because microbes are persnickety. They like natural things, they don't like synthetic and you want the microbes in your soil. You don't wanna drive them away. And this is an aside, but native plants create a food web of interconnected species when you have native plants that are supposed to be in the area where you live. So you're actually catering to the microbes that are in your soil in your area with native plants. I have a lot of native plants, but I also have other plants that work well with them uh, and they're not invasive. They also are environmentally good because you're building your soil and you have all those benefits of retaining moisture. Good soil actually will take pollutants out of the air and store them in the soil, if you have good soil, along with carbon. So environmentally good soil is a all around great thing for us. It's also financially great because it's really free. You're using natural ingredients that are supposed to go back into the earth from the trees and from your food, especially if you eat organic food, it's expensive, don't throw it away, use it for compost. And if you do have a vegetable garden, the health of your vegetables will be much better. There's no herbicides or any chemicals in it. And they also taste better. We all know anyone who's grown vegetables, they taste so good. You just pick them off the vine. They don't have to travel. You're not using gas to ship them somewhere. So it's also helping the, the environment. It's, it's an all around win-win situation. Welcome to my garden. It's not always ship shape. It's more of a wild kingdom. I have vegetables that we grow uh, organically uh, throughout the year with our compost. And we also use compost teas. I have comfrey plants. If you choose to grow comfrey, you wanna use the Bocking 14 type because they don't spread, but they do have roots that go down 20 or 30 feet. So they're really acting as trees to mine the nutrients that are way down in the subsoil. 
And the leaves are great. You can just place them on top of your soil and let them deteriorate. You can chop them up. You can use them as mulch. You can put them in your composter. It's great. I use alfalfa meal for nitrogen as a supplement for my vegetable garden as when I plant them. I side dress them with alfalfa meal. And bone meal is a fabulous nitrogen additive and also fish emulsions. So these are all natural ways to keep your garden healthy and your soil uh, in tip top shape. So autumn repays the earth, the leaves, which summer lent it. Please put your leaves and your food waste to work in your garden. If you can't do that in your garden or you don't have a place to do that, if your county or region has an organic waste collection, please utilize that. Keep this valuable resource out of our landfills. When we put it in our landfills, we get bad chemicals that leach out into the soil. We get anaerobic breakdown of the organic material and uh, we get methane gas in our atmosphere. So help us and use your leaves. If you have any questions of, about what, just what we talked about, please, please ask me. Yes, we have several questions. Good. The first question came in at the end of the last session. Does shredding leaves with your mower damage the blade? Uh, no, it does not at all. The leaves are kind of dry at that point. Even the green leaves don't do it. It's a great way to shred your leaves. Does it matter if the eggshell is raw or boiled? No, it doesn't. It doesn't matter at all. Because when you boil it, it's already kind of cleaned out and you can just crunch it and put it in there. When you use a raw egg, I like to wash it out because it's animal proteins in there and they might draw rodents. Which one is it better to leave the leaves for the insects or to compost the leaves <laughs> as in shredding it? I would do both. I have neighbors that are not gardeners and I pile those leaves against the fences. We have wire fences between our property. And I pile those leaves up against the fences so weeds can't kind of migrate into my yard. It's a great way to have a habitat and to help you out in the next season for weeding in the spring. So if you can do a little bit of both in your garden, that's awesome. How to uh, keep rodents out of your compost? What are the ways? <laughs> Okay, um, I when I first started, I had problems with the rodents, but what I was doing was I was not keeping my compost as moist as it should be. Compost should feel like a damp sponge. When you go in there and grab, a, uh, you should be able to squeeze it, but water should not drip out, so it should be moist. And if you turn it at least once a week, the rodents won't go in there because they won't want their habitat disturbed and they won't go in there. So turning it, keeping it moist, and uh, not putting meat, dairy products in there, keeping grease and oil out of it will work like a charm. You have a picture that shows different bins, some with covers, some without the covers. What is the difference, or does it matter if it's covered or not covered? Compost bins can be covered. I like to leave mine open because I want the rain to get in. Moisture is important. And if I don't have to water my compost and just go out there and turn it, it's great. If it's too wet, you wanna cover it. We just had four days of straight rain. I go out there and I turn it and I still had dry leaves in there because leaves shed the water. So they really do roll the water off. So when you do make your compost, you wanna make sure you water every layer before you put new stuff on top because you will get a dry bottom or a center or the sides will dry out. So by turning that all in and keeping the moisture even would be a great thing. So I hope I answered that question. If there's a lot of rain, you wanna keep it covered, You know, just go out and assess it. But mine was open for four days during that rain and when I turned it, it still had dry leaves in it. So it's all up to the, the way your compost looks. This person is asking about they have an oak tree removed in June and had the stump grounded. How long do I have to wait before I can use it for mulch? This question comes up all the time about how this is robbing nutrients from the soil. In my experience, I use horticulture wood chips in my perennial and shrub areas in my garden. I place them about every one or two years and they are chips. I put them all in there and it reduces the amount of weeds. Now, if you think about the nitrogen, 
it's in the soil, okay? So on the top of the soil, you're not really robbing the nutrients from the plants. If you take those wood chips and you bury them, I had this experience. I built uh, several new vegetable gardens and I made them, they were about three feet high. And I used this uh, hugu culture. It's where you put wood logs and branches at the bottom of these beds so that you don't have the big expense of buying all the soil to fill up your bed. So I put in the bottom of my bed, a very large amount of wood chips along with the logs and the branches. And then I added about six, six inches of, of uh, soil. So that next year, weeds didn't grow, plants didn't grow, nothing grew. And I had thought that I might have put a black walnut log in there because my neighbor had one cut down and I kept it. But in essence, the next year, everything grew like gangbusters. It just proved to me that when you bury those wood chips, you do get a big nitrogen rob from your soil and nothing will grow. To go over that again, if you put it on top of the soil, you're not going to do any damage with the nitrogen loss. If you bury it, you're going to have a big nitrogen loss. Does uh, shredding the leaves kill the insects or do the insects move in after you shred them? No. Uh, when you shred the leaves, you have more dead insects than live insects. So yes, you do injure the, the insect population. But if you have the whole leaves as mulch all around your beds, you're saving those leaves, depending on how much you have. I have an overabundance of leaves, so I can leave the whole leaves under my shrubs and under my perennials. And uh, I still have plenty that I store in a part of my garden whole. And I only use a few to make leaf mold. What is woodland soil that is used to oh, make okay. leaf mold? Okay, so woodland soil is soil that's not disturbed. So either a park or uh, someplace where, where it's not cultivated. So you just want to brush the debris away and just get two or three scoops of that soil. It's really good soil that hasn't been walked on. It's healthy and it's been fed by the leaves in the forest. So they have a lot of microbes in it. Okay, I just wanted to add one little part about companion planting. And I always wanted to teach people about companion planting. And while studying the soil, it kind of dawned on me, a bell went off that companion planting is actually bringing nutrients or sharing nutrients. It's a symbiotic relationship where one plant will draw more nutrients to the plant and help another plant. So it's really important to think about your soil and how the microbes in your soil work. And by feeding it good organic leaf mold and composting, you are doing so much for your garden that uh, it's just amazing. That's about all I have. I have resources and we have a handout available if people wanna do further research. If you have uh, more questions, you can send them to the MGMV help desk. Okay, that concludes today's uh, presentation. Thank you, Lena. That was a wonderful, very thorough presentation. Please follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram.